and I expect she'll be here before long, but I think she's in, intensely involved in that uh, other meeting. And um, I'm not a scientist, I'm not a biologist, I don't do original scientific work. Um, what I took to do is uh, review the work of scientists and um, try to um, synthesize the work from a lot of different sources and find some pattern to it and then kind of interpret that for a, a general public audience. And I'm sure all of you who have read scientific papers know that it's sometimes pretty hard to see how the information presented in those research papers really um, relate uh, to the kinds of questions that you want to answer. So I'm, that's what I uh, am attempting to do here. Um, a few a couple of years ago, an organization called the Alaska Center for Climate Assessment and Policy uh, gave me a very tiny little grant to, uh, to take a look at what we know about climate change, how climate change affects commercial fisheries in Alaska, and also uh, try to put together a little bit of thinking about uh, adaptation, how the industry and the public can, adapt, can adapt to the changes uh, that are occurring. And most of what I'm going to talk about in the next hour or so is um, the changes that we are able to observe or have been documented by the scientists. And then I'm hoping that we'll get a little discussion afterward about uh, the issue of adaptation. I hope you'll kind of participate with me if you have any interest. So um, this is basically, did I, I didn't, I already forgot to change it, didn't I? So this is um, basically what this will uh, cover, a, a little bit about ocean climate, <coughs> a little bit about um, the difference between short-term and long-term climate, um, a little bit about ocean acidification, well you can read what it says, and then um, some a compilation of observed effects on um, fisheries here, and then some extremely tentative projections about what you might expect to occur over, I say to the, to the middle part of the century, which is kind of like the working life of people who are getting in, into the industry right now. And then if, if we have time and if we have interest, we'll get into the subject a little bit of adaptation. So here's the main points to keep in mind. Is, this is all obvious, but sometimes people kind of forget or they kind of get confused. So here are, the, here are the main points to remember. Weather is not climate. If it's hot this winter, that doesn't mean climate change. That means we had warm weather this winter. Um, and uh, temporary climate variation, of which there's a great deal uh, in the ocean, in Alaska, is not climate change. Uh, climate uh, regimes shift uh, periodically on various scales, annual scales and decadal scales and so on. You, you, all, you all know about the blob and you know about El Nino and those are not climate change, those are uh, climate variation. Now those factors may be influenced by climate, but those are not climate. Um, and the, there is a long-term trend, an identifiable long-term trend, but it can easily be masked by these, um, these temporary variations. And, but the reason that we pay attention to these temporary variations is that we sort of assume that what we observe during warm periods now give us some indication of what to expect in the long term as the long term um, uh, uh, climate warming continues. It's what might be coming down the road some years from now. So here's some uh, basic facts about Alaska's climate. Um, we all know Alaska's warming. Uh, we all know that it's been fairly spectacular, particularly in the, in the Arctic. But an interesting thing that often slips people's mind, escapes people's mind, is that most of the heat, the increase in heat in the atmosphere, goes into the ocean. The ocean is, you know, most of the world is the ocean, and most of the, this trapped heat goes into the ocean. The thing is that the ocean is a huge, big heat sink, so the ocean temperature doesn't jump up and down like uh, temperature does on the land, but all that heat's going into the ocean and being observed, absorbed and most of it just in the upper layers. And um, the um, a, a sort of recurring theme that you'll see as we go along is that 
there have been various of these regime changes over the decades, over the centuries, but one occurred in the middle 1970s that was particularly dramatic, and you'll see that illustrated a few places uh, here as we go along, this 1970, approximately 1976 regime shift. And um, I just uh, heard a NOAA presentation over in Kodiak yesterday in which they had recorded a, a long-term climate change, uh, ocean temperature change, of about three quarters of a degree Celsius, or a little over one degree uh, Fahrenheit, over the last 40 years. That's the that's the the trend. That's the averages of all the ups and all of the downs. And then, if you were at that other meeting, you heard that um, in the last two years, uh, temperatures have been two to four degrees um, above the long term, um, the 10 year, not long term, the 10 year trend. So what we're definitely seeing right now is a, is a warming trend, a dramatic warming trend, but not necessarily, what we've seen in the last couple of years isn't necessarily what's going to continue uh, indefinitely. So um, the long term uh, temperature increase isn't, isn't constant and isn't linear. It's affected by all these other factors, the Pacific decadal oscillation, these regime shifts, the El Ninos that you all have heard about, the blob and all that, um, have uh, effect, have impact on these long-term trends. And a term that you often hear in the, in the scientific world is Pacific Decadal Oscillation. And I've got a kind of an illustration of that. Uh, positive PDO periods uh, tend to associate with warmer, uh, warmer ocean water conditions. And they have a, a profound effect on um, ocean productivity, even if it's uh, temporary. So this is an illustration of the line that you're looking at is not temperature. The line you're looking at is uh, variation or anomaly, temperature anomalies. But as you can see, it just goes up and down, up and down, up and down. Um, and um, starting, I mentioned 1976, and you can see right about here, you can see what happened. This was, this was a cool regime in here that went back to, well, this went back to the 1940s and there were others before that, but since 76 uh, we've been in a period of increasingly warm anomalies. Now they're not consistently warm, sometimes they drop back down and are cool again, but the anomalies have been in that very uh, positive upward direction. So here's another indication of um, of these anomalies. This is a PDO <coughs> graph, and obviously the, the red above the line are the, are the warm years, and the cool above, below the line are the cool years. And again, if you look back to about roughly 76, you can see that since then it's been mostly uh, warm anomalies, pretty dramatically warm. And before that, back to the 1940s, it was mostly cool. And if you think back to your fishing history or what you know about um, marine mammals or what you know about a whole lot of other things that live in the ocean, you probably remember the things, a lot of things changed at that point. <coughs> um, <coughs> this effect that, you know, we talked about the greenhouse gas effect and all that, um, which is mostly reflected in temperature, um, has other implications. It's not just water temperature. The sea level is rising. We don't really see that here in Alaska for the most part because at the same time the land is rising, so the relative height isn't changing that much. Uh, but it, uh, in other parts of the world where the land is not rebounding like it is here, um, there's uh, really well developed. What? You're gonna, is there, are we supposed to go to the next slide or is this? No, I'm still on that. Okay. Oh, I'm not on that. Oh, good, thanks. Yeah, sorry. Um, so you can see the temperature effect, and then you can see sea level rise and Arctic sea ice, and then surface pH. We'll get to that in a minute uh, about the um, the pH and uh, acidification. So there's a lot of um, effects of um, warming in the ocean it does a lot of things. Um, increasing uh, 
frequency and severity of storms is one of them. And there's both good and bad to that because storms um, create mixing in the upper level and um, bring a lot more food into the photic zone so that uh, there's better uh, productivity in the ocean. Um, changes currents and circulation patterns both in the atmosphere and in the ocean. And this is a really big part of the story. And I, I believe that it's really not very well understood yet um, how these changing circulation patterns affect uh, productivity, fishery productivity. Um, you're all aware that um, when you have warming conditions, stream conditions change dramatically and you can have uh, both streams drying up and you can also have flooding and scouring. And then sea ice, I'll mention sea ice just briefly. It's not so important here, but in the Bering Sea, this is a really big story, the amount of sea ice coverage. And the reason for that is that um, there's um, algae that grow on the bottom of the ice, uh, phytoplankton. And the timing of the bloom, when the, the sea ice melts back and that um, those phytoplankton bloom, affects downstream the bloom of the zooplankton and the, the food that's available to the young fish and so on. So um, if you have to be involved in a fishery out in the Bering Sea, you would be very, uh, this would be an important factor in your business. The extent of the sea ice, how far south it comes, and, um, and when it retreats. And the reason, the, the reason it's so important is that the, the microorganisms that bloom um, are what are fed on by the commercially important fish, and those um, microorganisms change in their species composition and their energy content um, depending upon <coughs> when that bloom takes place. And um, it, it may seem paradoxical, but the energy content of the plankton is actually better during cold years than it is during warm years, and that's a really complicated process that I can't explain, but it's widely recognized all up and down the coast of you know, cooler years, you have more the lipid rich, fat rich um, zooplankton. And this example, this is a, a neocalanus, it's a, a um, copepod. copepod that's found all, all along the coast, up in the Bering Sea and on this coast. And um, this is a cheap source of food for young for a young pollock and for young salmon and other things. And this is a nice fat one. This one was uh, photographed at a time during a cool year when the, the copepods were doing really well in the area that Breshoff uh, photographed it. Um, in warm years, those are less abundant or they're skinnier. They simply don't have as much nutrition in them. And I heard um, over at the other meeting earlier there were some questions uh, pertaining to why warmer water affects um, salmon production here. And this is part of the answer that um, when you have warmer water, you have these copepods that are not as robust, not as numerous, or not as robust, or you have different species. This is really uh, apparent down on the uh, Pacific coast states because shifting currents bring different species of copepods in, and that, that affects along the uh, the young of the, the, the out migrant uh, salmon, what they have to eat affects how successful they are two or three, four years later. Uh, another thing that often comes with warm water is invasive species. Um, as far as I've been able to tell, there's not much that's really been established in Alaska so far. It's not like we've been over, overwhelmed with, um, you know, big sharks or um, mackerels, they, they come up some years and then they leave again, and um, we, we haven't really been overwhelmed with um, invasive species. What we have observed, however, are some indigenous species that go into these, these blooms, these explosions of abundance. Um, one of them is this um, jellyfish here, the sea nettle, and I'm sure those of you who net fish have seen some years when there's a big abundance of those um, Scientists have recorded um, orders of orders of magnitude increases ten times as many from one year to another, and they've tended to occur during the warmer years. Another thing that becomes more abundant is arrowtooth flounder. And then finally, the um, I think it's the last thing that's really on this list is these harmful algal blooms. 
Now, I, I've lived for many years down in the southeast and on uh, Catchback Bay and then over in, um, on the Bering Sea coast. And I always thought that um, PSP was more or less confined to southeast. And uh, it turns out that's not true at all. Uh, PSP is down um, all, all the way up, pretty much all the way up to the Arctic. Now, this illustration <coughs> pertains to marine mammals. These uh, toxins have been found in the tissues of marine mammals. But it was just a handy graphic just to illustrate the fact that um, these um, harmful algal blooms occur along the entire coast, coast of Alaska. Um, the other one, aside from PSP, the other one is uh, this domoic acid. And if you follow the fisheries news from down in the States, you know that this has had a tremendous impact um, in the Pacific Coast states because the clams pick it up and then the crabs eat the clams and then the crabs become toxic and there have been total, total closures of the, um, of the uh, Dungeon S fishery uh, down in the states. Um, they eventually opened, but they, I mean, they missed two years ago, they missed their entire winter, uh, winter season because of closure due to uh, uh, demoic acid. And it started showing up here and um, it's showing up in sandlands, and it's showing up in, um, it's suspected in various other uh, die-offs like um, seabird die-offs and possibly even whale die-offs that it might be a factor in, um, in those uh, anomalous uh, mortality events. So that's just kind of a quick background on, on climate change in the ocean. Um, from Fisher's point of view, there's really, I think, three things we're concerned about. The abundance of the, of the important, commercially important stocks, any changes that might occur in their distribution, and then changes that might occur in their behavior, and that would be things such as run timing or the migration routes that they take. <coughs> so, in general, and I think if you were at the other meeting, I think you heard one of the biologists state this. In general, in uh, high latitudes, northern latitudes, when the water gets a little warmer, that's a good thing. It, it means greater primary productivity. Um, however, it doesn't always work out that way when it comes to any particular uh, target species. You might have greater overall productivity, but it might be the wrong stuff. Like I was saying, the um, zooplankton, if it's the wrong species of zooplankton, then that might, that might not be doing you any good. The, um, the fish that you want to catch may not be finding the ones uh, that they need. So it's possible that even in a period of higher general productivity, you might have a decline in the commercial species that you're looking for. And it's probably a function of food, of competition with uh, competing uh, species, such as, for example, the competition from the arrowtooth flounder or something like that. Um, predation and disease. So there's um, there's a lot of different ways that these uh, that your commercial fishing stocks can be affected by these climate changes. Here's a I think this is kind of a well-known graphic. Um, you can see that um, back in the prior again prior to the regime shift, the system was dominated by shrimp. And then after that uh, regime shift, when we went from a cooler regime to a warmer regime, uh, about approximately 1976, um, the shrimp just plummeted. And they were but the overall productivity of the system didn't decrease. In fact, it, well, no, it didn't really increase either. It stayed pretty constant. But it was replaced by flatfish and by cod and pollock. And uh, I don't know if here, if a lot of you were shrimp fishermen or not, but I, when I lived in Homer, people said, oh yeah, we used, we used to have great um, shrimp and crab fishery in Ketchumak Bay, but we fished them all out. You know, it wasn't well managed, it was all fished out. Well, it was really good indication it didn't have anything to do with fishing them out, it had to do with a uh, shift in the climate regime from a cool regime to a, a warmer regime, which disfavored the crab and the shrimp and favored the pollock and flatfish. Um, the second factor I mentioned is uh, distribution. Some parts of the world, including the U.S. East Coast, there's really uh, dramatic shifts in the center of abundance of key species, like 
New England lobster have just, they moved north. They practically abandoned the southern part of the range and they're really abundant in Maine and, and uh, the Canadian coast. Um, and in Europe that's occurred with some other, with some cods and things like that. We haven't really seen that here, probably because of the shape of the Gulf of Alaska. There's, there's really no place north you can go, you know, you know, on most of the Gulf. The area that's fishery productive is already pretty much at the northern end of, of the Gulf, and so there's no place to go. Um, in the Bering, that's different, and um, there has been some documented uh, subtle shifts in center of abundance uh, on the order of like 30 kilometers or something like that for, for various species has been documented. Not enough to really have much effect. You would look at that um, Bering Sea and you say, well, shoot, man, they can go way up north. But the interesting thing is that there's this cold pool, um, this, um, this area here, of super chilled water that's kind of more or less at the edge of the shelf and a continental shelf and um, the pollock at least don't seem to like to cross that. They don't, they'll go into it, they'll kind of venture in, but they don't like to just wholesale shoot across and up into the northern part of the, of the Bering Sea. Um, so I haven't really found a whole lot to say about um, uh, displacement sh change in um, change in um, location of stocks. There's probably some some minor ones, but nothing that's really proven to be very dramatic during these warm periods that we've been uh, expressing. There's actually probably a few possibly good things about um, uh, this warming trend. One is, as I mentioned before, because of uh, more intense storms. There's uh, more mixing, you know, the nutrients come up from the deep water and the wave action oxygenates the surface and it mixes the nutrients with the uh, oxygen and the sunlight and <coughs> produces more primary uh, productivity. Um, and uh, also sh uh, species shifts such as we have experienced so far, which is not much, could eventually uh, produce uh, new fishing opportunities. That's definitely occurred in other areas, but we haven't really seen it here yet. Okay, that's, I'm going to digress for a moment from warming to the subject of ocean acidification, because as I mentioned, that's another one of these, these uh, atmospheric carbon dioxide related issues. It, it's not a function of climate, but it's, it's, it's related to climate due to its uh, origin. So the main message here to remember is the ocean is not becoming acidic. <laughs> it's not going to burn your skin if you stick your hand into it. It's not going to eat away your prop or anything like that. Um, what it's becoming is a little bit less alkaline. If you know how the chemistry works, the ocean is a pretty far over on the alkaline side. It's around 8.2 8 or something like that with uh, 7 being uh, neutral. And what has occurred in the last few decades is a slight shift toward the neutral, which if it were to continue, um, ultimately it would shift over to the acidic side. But that's, nobody, nobody thinks that's going to happen. Um, and it's not uniform. Um, you know, the ocean's really complex and some places are uh, more so-called acidic than others. And the deep water tends to be more than the shallow water. And there's been a lot of documentation of more acidic water coming up onto the shelf in Alaska. It's been actually pretty well documented that um, Alaskan nearshore waters, the waters where the fisheries occur, or the shallower waters where the fisheries occur, are in the process of going through the shift to a slightly more acidic state. Um, but the interesting thing to me is that it's not actually the pH, it's not the acidity of the water, um, that's a biological concern. It's this other factor known as omega, which is um, it's the relative abundance of calcium carbonate ions in the water. In other words, the amount of free calcium carbonate in the water that can be used for shell building. And everything from king crabs down to these little pteropods um, build some kind of a, a shell. All the, all the mollusks, all the um, 
all the shell builders need this free calcium carbonate in the water. And if that, uh, uh, if the amount of that, if the concentration of that, what they call supersaturated, if it becomes less saturated, then there's less of that available for shell building. So uh, this omega factor is a measure of how much of that's available. And um, it takes us, uh, takes a certain amount of that to, uh, to be um, of use to these organisms. And if it falls below that level, they can't build their shells and they'll die off and it becomes even more, um, if, if that factor becomes even smaller, it actually becomes corrosive to their shells in the sense that their shells will actually kind of dissolve. And that's been shown very dramatically in the laboratory. It hasn't really appeared in, in real life here in Alaska, although there has been um, some effect down in the states in shellfish hatcheries where they've actually lost whole um, brood uh, years in shellfish hatcheries uh, because of this corrosive water that comes up onto the, where the continental shelf is pretty narrow down off the coast of Oregon. Um, so this is a big potential long-term concern. It's not only for king crab, but these pteropods are the base of the food chain. That pteropod that we saw a moment ago is the base of the food chain for a lot of other things. And it's, the, it's the main part of the diet, or a major part of the diet of juvenile pink salmon, for example. So if the water should become acidic enough that they start to die off, then that's going to have uh, big effects on, um, on salmon, among other things. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so I'll have to read off the screen. Um, so, so far, from what I can determine, I, I monitored uh, you know, 150 scientific publications and a bunch of press reports and interviewed a bunch of scientists and um, basically what I could determine is that the effects of long-term climate change on our fisheries so far have been minimal, um, practically not detectable. Lots of effects of these temporary shifts, but in terms of this gradual, this three quarters of a degree increase or whatever, it doesn't have a big effect uh, on our fisheries yet. So a lot of the literature, because scientists haven't really had anything to really dig their uh, dig their fingers into in terms of Alaska fisheries, a lot of the scientific literature is focused on the effects of warming trends in the Pacific Northwest, which have been much more dramatic and then effects of these temporary uh, climate factors like uh, we were talking about a minute ago. So in the Northwest, if you are from there or if you follow the fishery down there, you know um, they've had a, a number of years of poor salmon returns. And that, the thing that's perplexing is that it's not uniformly um, poor. They've had some dynamite years too. The Columbia River has had some really good uh, years, although a lot of that's based on you know artificial enhancement and so on. But um, but in the wild systems, they've had, uh, you know, they've had droughts and they've had um, stream, stream uh, temperatures that were too high. Um, the troll fisheries, and it looks like they're going to have pretty nearly a complete troll closure uh, in the Pacific states again this year, and that also means a closure of the ocean sport fisheries. So um, uh, this long-term warming trend that they've been uh, experiencing has been pretty pretty hard on their salmon fisheries. Um, as I mentioned a moment ago, the Dungeness fishery was closed, uh, big parts of it were closed for going on two years now um, because of demonic acid. And they've had um, these invasions of these uh, species, warm water species that have come up and they've had these areas that are called dead zones off the coast of Oregon and California, big stretches of the ocean that are, have low oxygen content and nothing can live there. Um, we haven't really had that, um, it hasn't been that serious here yet. So here's a, just a very brief summary of what we think we know about the effects of long-term climate change here. And um, the first one is, is Pollock, you know, I don't, is anybody here involved in the Pollock fishery? 
Um, but, you know, that's Alaska's biggest commercial fisheries pollock and in terms of uh, tonnage, mostly in the Bering Sea, the western Gulf of Alaska. And as I mentioned earlier, they're dependent on these uh, lipid rich, these fat um, uh, zooplankton in the early life stage. And um, they need to really bulk up on fat as they go into the first winter, or they will starve to death over the winter. Um, so they tend to do best during these cool phase years, because that's when the zooplankton are the best, or the most, um, uh, have the highest energy content. And at the same time that the food source is poorer during the warm years, the, uh, their metabolism is, is more rapid in the warmer water, and they're uh, more susceptible to predators, because the predators that like to feed on them are ones that do better uh, during warm years. Um, in particularly arrowtooth flounder and, and salmon, although interestingly the, the biggest predator on juvenile pollock is adult pollock, but if they make it through that early life stage then they do pretty well in these warmer years. Um, I was talking to a uh, pollock biologist last week and she said, well, you know, there's actually some hopeful signs. Um, they've taken some They've been able to use the uh, cold pool a little bit as a refuge, and they seem to be doing better. And I said, oh, does this mean they're adapting? And she said, well, I, wouldn't, I think maybe they were just lucky <laughs> two years in a row. I'm not sure they're really adapting. Um, biologists are predicting a pretty dramatic decrease in, um, in recruitment into the fishery um, by the middle of the century if this gradual warming trend uh, continues. Another interesting thing is that, aside from going north, their other response to warming water is to go further out on the shelf, where they can go deeper into cooler water, and that puts them across the international day line and puts them in the range of uh, the Russian troll fleet. Um, halibut, well, I'm sure most of you here know that uh, halibut recruitment has been uh, down for a number of years, uh, not because there are fewer halibut, but because their growth is slower. And there's lots of explanations for that. Uh, a lot of people think the arrowtooth flounder competition from arrowtooth flounder is a big part of that. Um, there's uh, some work that's been going on up at UAF that suggests that it actually may have more have to do with the management of the fishery and the selective, um, the selective effects of the fishery on um, recruitment of um, of um, harvestable halibut. So it's, it's a little unclear how that's going to pan out, but um, it, there does seem to be a trend that flatfish in general do better during warmer, um, warmer phases, during warmer regimes. So there's, there's reason to hope that there's indication that the halibut's um, abundance has, has bottomed out and is starting to make a recovery. So that, that might turn out to be a good story. Crab is another matter, and you know I don't, I actually don't have anything on Dungeness. What I've got is king tanner and snow crab, and it doesn't look real rosy for any of those three for a variety of reasons. One of them is the acidification issue, of course, um, but a lot of it has to do with changes in the way the current distributes distributes the uh, juveniles and what kind of um, uh, what kind of uh, food they can find. And um, is, there you go, you can see right there what happened. Um, you know, 1976. Now, you can also see that it, it peaked about that time. It was much lower, this is tenor crab, uh, it was much lower prior to that. But since then, it's been an almost continuous downhill slide uh, for tanners. This is not uh, prison sound tanners. This is, um, statewide, I believe, that figures from. Uh, you can see right there, there's the, um, the uh, factor of using a solution low pressure index, which is not exactly the same as, uh, the, um, as the overall regime, but it's the driving factor of it, the location and intensity of solution low pressure. And, um, you can see that when it went into a warm phase, um, the uh, red king crab 
uh, production uh, decreased uh, dramatically. And I think it might be one. Oh, and, and this uh, this one illustrates the effect of uh, predation, or not the effect of, but the abundance of predators. That um, same thing, right? After that regime shift, or in, in accompanying temporally that regime shift, the uh, abundance of crab uh, went down, and the abundance of cod and sole uh, went up. So um, whether the cod and the sole are the cause of the decline of the king crab, or whether the two just occurred concurrently because of other ocean factors, I don't, I'm not sure that's ever been uh, really established, but it's a well, well recognized correlation anyway. So salmon, well, this is a really complicated subject because there's so many different stocks. Um, they have two freshwater phases and a long ocean migration. Um, there are, you know, you know, you know way more about salmon than I do, most of you, and uh, you know how complex the salmon situation is. But the interesting thing is there's some paleo record taken from um, lake bed uh, core samples where they can, and this has actually occurred out in Bristol Bay, but they can drill down in the bottom of the lake and they fill up these core samples and they can see the composition of the substrate down there and they can tell how much of that is, is um, biological material from salmon. And they found that um, there have been wild fluctuations, pretty historically, long before there's any commercial fishery, huge fluctuations in abundance of salmon, and they correlated them to climate regimes, because we've been having these climate regimes going back, I mean, um, you know, for thousands, tens of thousands of years. So indications are that, at least out there, uh, salmon did better during mm -hmm. warm regimes than they did during uh, cool regimes. So um, that's sort of encouraging, at least for some species. Um, it's not so clear that that's working out great for Chinook, however, and maybe, maybe Cove as well. Um, here's another indication. These are uh, climate regime shifts. You can see right there, 1976. And you can see what happened to sockeye and what happened to pink. They jumped up. And you know, I was just getting into the fishing industry at that time, and I recall um, you know, everybody saying, I was fishing down the southeast, and everybody was saying it was the timber industry down there that was killing off the salmon. But statewide, there was a lot of belief that it had to do with high seas interceptions, Japanese high seas drifters, and that kind of thing. And they cut out the high sea drifters, and the salmon came roaring back. They said, oh, you know, great. We did a great job. We, we got uh, control of this um, interception fishery. But it's a little bit less clear now that that was actually the cause of this, of this big uh, increase in returns. It could very well have been linked um, to this climate regime shift. <clears throat> so um, there have been some documented uh, behavior changes, um, slight shift in timing of of runs, at least in some places. There's a Auk Creek in Juneau has been monitored continuously for like 40 years. And over that time, the, the, um, both the out migration and the return of pink salmon to that creek has advanced by about two weeks. And that's a, that's a long, that's not just contingent on a particular year, that's a long term uh, increase. Um, Generally, statewide, Chinook have been getting fewer and smaller. Lots of discussion, as you know, about what the reason, uh, at least for the decrease in abundance, has been. Um, it's an interesting subject. It's not really a direct, any direct concern to, to us, but it's interesting that salmon seem to be moving into the Arctic. They've always been there, and they probably just weren't very well recorded, but. Um, they're moving, their Pacific salmon are found all the way across the Arctic now, clear to the Atlantic Ocean. And um, they're showing, they seem to be showing up in greater numbers, although the, the constraint on them is, is not the summer foraging, it's the um, spawning, spawning and rearing habitat. Those rivers freeze up, and so it, they're probably not advancing that much. They're probably not establishing new spawning populations as much as they are simply uh, roaming up there more. <clears throat> Um, so, th 
this is sort of what the report suggests. Now, nobody, nobody come out and said this is what's going to happen, but if you read a bunch of these studies and you see what the, uh, what the trends have been, um, warmer ocean conditions have tended to produce uh, better conditions for pinks and chums, provided that, they, that, that the, stream, the stream habitat is suitable. And you know, a, a, a cool thing about pinks and chums is that they don't stay in the stream uh, through the year, so you can actually have a stream that dries up, and I've seen this uh, over in the Kenai Peninsula. Streams are bone dry in July, but they had big schools of pinks and chums swimming around at the mouth, and a couple weeks later, get into August, and it starts raining, and the creek refills, and they go up and spawn, and they rear over the winter, and the next spring, they're out of there before the, the summer period has occurred. So um, they can, they're more likely to be survivors during these um, warming periods. Um, sockeye also seem to benefit from warmer conditions because they feed on uh, plankton in the lake before they go to sea. And if you have warm conditions in the lake, you're likely to get um, more aggressive uh, blooming of the lake plankton. The problem is that uh, you have to hope, I mean, there's fish come out of the creek, uh, out of the lake and out of the creek, and they're big and robust and, and full of, you know, the bigger, the bigger a salmon is when it hits the salt water, the better its chance of survival. Um, but that depends upon there being food uh, in the estuary and in the ocean when they get there. And if the timing of the bloom in the lake and the timing of the outmigration gets out of sync with the bloom in the ocean, then you could have all these big herky smolts hitting the ocean and then just starving when they get out there. So that's, that's a concern that nobody at this point, as far as I know, has really been able to determine with any certainty is how that's all going to work out. But if the bloom in the lake is a little early and the bloom in the ocean is a little early and they stay in, in, uh, in uh, sequence, um, then we could reasonably expect to have a good sockeye production. Uh, in the future, and I, I was, well, I saw part of that presentation over at the other hall, and it was interesting that, I, that if you looked at those numbers, since that 76 regime shift, when we went into a warmer phase, sake production has been better. It's better than it was previous to that. The slightly confusing thing was that Chinook production was better, too, for most of that time, and indications have been that this warmer climate seems to be not so good for Chinook. Now, the last couple of years have not been good, but they've been really anomalously warm, warm conditions, much, much just off the charts warm compared to the long term. So the Chinook may, Chinook may have simply not been able to adapt so quickly to those extremely warm conditions. Um, so back to my original statement about thinking in terms of, the, when I say long term, I'm saying like from now to the middle of the century. I'm saying for those young people are getting into the fishery now, what can they expect to find by the time they reach retirement age? Um, and I think, you know, my, my projection, not prediction, but projection, is that there's going to be profound change. <clears throat> we haven't begun to see, to see what's going to happen. It's going to be a dramatic change. <clears throat> but I don't think it's going to be cataclysmic. I don't think the fishery is going to collapse. I don't think Cordova is going to be a ghost town. But I do think that it's going to require changes, changes in uh, behaviors by the industry, changes in focus in how fishing is done and how the product is handled and, and all of that. And those of you who have been in it a few decades know that the year-to-year the -year change in things like the market, the value of the product in the market, in the general economics, you know, what the, what the dollar is doing in international markets and all of that, and changes in technology have had pretty profound effects. We've had years when nobody made any money and we've had years when people got rich and it had to do not so much with the abundance of sand, but it had to do with the, um, how valuable that product was on the market or how refrigeration had been improved, how processing had changed to make higher value products uh, out of the fish uh, that we were catching. 
And so I think this is going to continue to happen. You're, you're going to have some kind of change with the uh, availability of, of, the, of the fish to catch. But you're going to also have these other dramatic changes. We were, Tori, <laughs> Tori remembers when we were doing the trade adjustment assistance when it looked like the salmon industry was just about going to collapse and we were trying to help people figure out how they were going to survive uh, because of this assumed uh, competition from um, in, um, foreign foreign produced uh, food products and so on. And, you know, we got over it. The, the uh, industry came through stronger, stronger than previously. And I think that same thing is going to continue to happen. But um, I think to do so, it's going to require a focused effort on the part of the industry to to think about adaptation, to think about how to adapt to these changes that are occurring. So um, I'm, I'm not going to really talk about adaptation, except to say that there's two, there's a public sector component, a private sector component. And if you go through all the, the literature on fisheries adaptation, you'll find that about 90% of it is about public sector adaptation. What can we do? We can we can get uh, we can do be better research. We can do better monitoring. Um, we can uh, make efforts to make the fleet more profitable in some way. And um, really, what the public sector can do in our system—it's different in other in other <coughs> economies. But in our system, about the only real effect, by and large, that the public sector adaptation has is on catch management um, effort and, and quotas. It's a huge amount of literature about how you can monitor these stocks and you can see what they're doing and then you can um, shift the fleet or you can control gear or you can have quotas or all that. But it all has to do with catch limitations. There's not really much. Sometimes the public sector does something like offer a loan program or it can produce better um, oh, satellite data so you can uh, know what the um, temperatures are doing, and so that will help you <coughs> help direct your fishing and all that. But really, about 80 or 90 percent of what's in the literature about adaptation is how we can do research to support management options that involve controlling the catch some way. Um, so what I'm really more interested in is public sector, is private sector adaptation. How do individual fishermen processors, communities um, adapt to these kinds of changes. And it's already going on in other parts of the world um, in, in some locations. Um, there are various ways of doing it, increasing efficiency, um, fuel efficiency, technical efficiency, you know, better electronics so that you spend less money. There, there's going to be a certain amount of catch out there. And so to survive a changing environment, one of the ways you do it is you spend less money to catch those fish. So anything you can do to improve your operational efficiency, and that might be things like cooperatives, or it might be um, developing or going back to old gear types that are more efficient or something like that. Um, and another very commonly cited form of adaptation is diversification. You know, and I'm, those of you who've been here in a while saw it. You know, we had for a long time everybody could make willing at salmon, and salmon got less abundant or less valuable, so they would put long line gear on, or they put shrimp gear on, or they do something to to diversify. And then salmon would come roaring back, and you'd see yards stacked full of um, long line gear and shrimp pots and things like that because it wasn't uh, appealing anymore. Um, so there's diversification within the fishery, and then there's diversification outside the fishery, and this is one of the things that we found ourselves talking about a lot with the Trade Adjustment Assistant Act is, well, s some folks are just going to say, it's not worthwhile anymore, I don't, I don't want fishing, is just too uncertain, I don't want to do it anymore, what can I do to make a living? And then other people say, I'm a fisherman, but I'm going to have, instead of going to Hawaii for the winter, I'm going to have to go, you know, down to the welding shop and get a job or something like that. Um, so there's a lot of ways of approaching that, and um, it's not anything that anybody can 
prescribe for anybody else's individual decisions that ever anyone's made. A, a really excellent form, I think, of diversification is, is product diversification. And that's one that fishermen don't have too much control over. It's largely processors. But if, if you've been following the seafood industry for the last couple of decades, you've seen a dramatic change from you know canning salmon to bone, uh, pin bone out portion controlled uh, vacuum packed uh, products. And that's a, that's a classic form of, of um, adaptation, taking a product in, in a changing economic and biological environment and, and getting greater value out of it. So uh, that's pretty much, I think, all I have to say. Um, I would, well, first of all, if you have any questions, and then secondly, if anybody would like to have a little dialogue about um, adaptation, about ideas that you've got about, based on this pretty sketchy information, I realize there's, there's nothing very clear cut about all this, but there's a general trend that the ocean's getting warmer and that the environment is changing and that the abundance of some of our key stocks are going to change and some of them are definitely going to decrease um, given what we think is occurring, does anybody have any ideas about ways to uh, adapt to those changes? So, any any questions or comments? Well, you kind of came one uh, slide there on a modest warming trend coming yeah. and suggested increased pink salmon abundance. But at what, I guess, what's the baseline for modest? Because also with not much difference in in pH change uh, with declining pteropod uh, production. I've seen one paper that suggested that a 10% decline in pteropod abundance would result in a 20% decline in pink salmon abundance. Mm -hmm. So, how modest, I guess, is the question. Well, yeah, that's a great question. And, uh, you know, I don't have the answer to that, but here's my observation. First of all, um, it would t uh, the little bit of change that we've seen in pH is not probably nearly enough to wipe out the pteropods. Now about, what was it, two years ago, I think there was a statewide pink salmon shortage. Everybody said, huh, there it is, there you see, that's what happened, the ocean got acidic and the pteropods all died off and the pink salmon disappeared. And, you know, that was, that was definitely alarming, but they were, having, they were gangbusters over in Russia. It was like the biggest pink salmon run they'd ever had in Russia. So I didn't, I wasn't quite convinced that the, the, that had happened. And I don't have the numbers, I don't have the numbers in my head, but my understanding is that when you see these, um, these illustrations, I'm sure you've seen of the, of the pteropod or some other organism, and you can see the shell being eroded, those are done in laboratories with extremely high um, acidic, uh, you know, it's it's controlled. It's not it's nothing like anything that we're experiencing currently. Now that said, as I mentioned, uh, there's a famous example of a shellfish hatchery down in Oregon that lost a whole batch of the you know the little the little um, larvae um, oyster larvae because of that effect. But that was down in Oregon. Um, so I mean, in short of it is I can't answer your question. What I'm seeing is, I'm personally not that alarmed about that factor. Now, maybe 50 years from now, uh, maybe it'll happen. I mean, if you go to these ocean acidification meetings, which I've attended a few, uh, they it's like the sky is falling. You know, it's like we've got all this data from all these monitoring stations, and the pH is just crashing. And what they mean is it's gone down by you know one tenth of one point, and over a period of you know 50 years, so. I'm not so convinced that that's a big factor. You've probably seen the articles in the paper about how the king crab are going to disappear because of ocean acidification. And I, I think that's a, a bit of a stretch. But in terms of temperature, when, when I say modest long-term warming, what I mean is if we, if the Gulf of Alaska gained three quarters of degrees Celsius in 40 years, I would call that modest. Um, some people wouldn't, they'd say that the sky is falling because of that too. But because the effects that we've seen so far have been pretty subtle, 
I think that in the foreseeable future, they're going to continue, but they're going to continue to be incremental. Um, now, a two to four degree increase in Princeton Sound in the northern Gulf in the last two years, that's not modest. That's pretty dramatic. But I don't believe that's long-term climate change. I believe that that's an anomaly. And that anomaly will, will reverse um, maybe this year or maybe next year or something. But I think it will be one of those squiggly lines like you saw before. Does that, did I address your question or not? Well, yeah, I, I mean, I've read another, another piece that suggests that the, the, the two greatest areas in the world in, in change in, in pH as a function of temperature change are the Gulf of Alaska and just east of Cape Horn. Mm -hmm. And that those areas typically in the past, not only because of their temperature, but I think something having to do with geography, were able to absorb and hold it, uh, more uh, carbon dioxide than elsewhere. So, in other words, comparing right here in the Gulf and Russia may not be a valid comparison because perhaps yeah, you're you know, right. there was less carbon dioxide retained in that water that then is becoming released and then you know, changing the pH. So I guess the question is, uh, at what point do the, uh, is, you know, where do you go from modest to dramatic in terms of a drop in terracotta production? I, w I would agree with everything you said. Um, there's this oceanographic conveyor belt that starts up in the North Atlantic and it works its way down, goes around Cape Horn and then comes up and the, that water is, the, uh, that's where a lot of the carbon dioxide has been absorbed mm -hmm. is in that conveyor belt and as you say it, uh, the colder water holds more and it works its way up the west coast and then gets up on the shelf here and that's why it's, it is uh, dramatic here. And, and your, my understanding is you're correct about that. Um, and I, you know, I guess what I would say is uh, tune into the, um, to that whole ocean acidification world. There's a whole bunch of people, that's their life now. There's an ocean acidification network um, in Alaska. <clears throat> a, a whole bunch of ocean scientists who are just drilled in on that. That's their whole life. And stay tuned to that. I. Like I said, I went to some meetings and I didn't come away nearly as alarmed as some of, the, as some of, the, of them were. Um, but I think that's kind of the nature of someone who's a specialist and that's what they get excited about, you know, is a tenth of a point on a ship. So, um, I don't know. Uh, I don't have an answer for that. What I can say is, and what I was trying to say at the end of my talk is, now's the time to start tuning in. I mean, you're here. Um, for whatever I can offer you, it's a starting point, and now maybe you know what some of the issues are to follow, and then you know get on the listserv for the ocean acidification network and some of these uh, climate uh, networks, and just follow it and see if you can see trends that are um, that are developing as they come along. Because I I really believe that that's going to be part of it. You can't you can't say well we'll just do it the way we always did. Because it's changing, the ocean's changing. Um, the core sampling data that you that you were talking about with mm -hmm. the was, is that also considered what some people say eDNA, like environmental DNA sampling? Or you look for a specific, like some people take water samples. I know that. Um, Pete, who works at the Science Center, he's in Japan, and they, they take water samples and check that for e-DNA and look for oh, the DNA. certain, oh. certain I don't, type of sample. I don't know about water. that. There's a, there's a biologist at UAF whose name escapes me right now, but mm -hmm. he and a couple of his colleagues have done some of that core sampling stuff, and I think in Edigik or Ugashik, I forget exactly where that was, but it was interesting but as far as I know it wasn't DNA it was simply physical material I and mean, they can just you know they can just do a chemical analysis of the sediment and see how much of it is um, salmonized yeah it's yeah. material that came out of salmon bodies mm -hmm. and uh, and that correlates to a bunch of other things which I don't really know much about except one thing I know a little bit about is stellar sea lions and um, I've been doing a work for a long time on stellar sea lions and the 
this same exact thing happened with stellar sea lions. The, the stellar population was believed to be, you know, a quarter of a million in the Gulf of Alaska, and then it, they just crashed. I mean, they just crashed, and hundreds of million dollars were spent trying to figure out why. And it, it turns out that the time they crashed is the time that this regime shift occurred, from a cooler to a warmer regime. And then when they went back, when, <laughs> believe it or not, archaeologists solved, or I wouldn't say they solved, but they contributed to this whole issue about what happened to the stellar sea lines, because they went to middens in the Aleutians, and they dug up these middens, and they looked at the bones that were in there, and they said, holy smokes, you know, back, whatever it was, 300 years ago, these people practically lived on stellar sea lions. There was so much stellar sea lion bone in these, in these um, sections that went down in the ground. And then they'd go up a few layers, like, there's no sea lions. And for a while they were living on albatross, believe it or not. And, um, and then they, all they had to do is they would just date, age, date those, um, those strata, and then they'd just go to the climate record, and there were these warm periods, and there were these cool periods, and they correlated pretty, pretty closely. There's some archaeologists in, I think it's Idaho, <laughs> done a lot of the work on, on stellar sea lions and the Aleutians. It's pretty interesting. So I expect a lot more of that information to become available as that kind of work continues. Well, I don't want to keep anybody. Does anybody, anybody who like to just step up and offer? I, I did an article for Pacific Fishing a couple of months ago in which I speculated a little bit about um, fishery adaptation. And I, I still haven't really received very much response to that. And, uh, you know, somebody says, well, psh, you're full of beans. That will never work. At least that would be a starting point for me. Because, <laughs> you know, I, I fish for... 17 years, and then I got out of it for reasons that didn't have anything to do with climate change. But So I have kind of a little sense of what some of the forces are, but you guys are doing it, you know, every year, and so you're much more tuned to it. And so I'd be, if anybody has any suggestions about... Yeah. yeah, I think that one thing that you didn't really get into too much, except for one of the, one of the extreme thing over there, is the changes in the hydrological cycle that is probably driven by the warming of the ocean. That warming of the ocean ends up driving more evaporation, get more evaporation, more clouds, and those, those clouds end up here. Especially here in Cordova, we have something called the Pineapple Express, and then it can rain. Just a couple of weeks ago, we had nonstop rain for it was about two weeks. It's nice this week, but it wasn't two weeks Sorry, ago. I missed that. Yeah, yeah, you did. But what's, what's happening is, especially during some of these warm years, is we're getting a lot of rain in the summertime and in the autumn, and it's scouring out some of the salmon streams. So you have changes in the streams. Uh, you could have you know loss of habitat. You could have destruction of the salmon reds. Too little rain is not good because then salmon can go up go upstream. But too much rain can actually block migration as well as alter the habitat. And if the habitat is altered, then the productivity will decrease because uh, salmon fishery is dependent on high returns for spawners. So every pair of salmon actually generates, you know, a lot more than a pair of salmon, like around 10 of them. The returns for spawner of five is a pretty good number. But in the case of Chinook salmon, like one fish and game report that I read on Yukon, it was like less than one. That means fewer salmon are coming back compared to their parents. But when it's, you know, way above one, several above one, then we can have a salmon fishery. But it could decrease of the stream productivity going down. It's, yeah, you're absolutely yeah. right. And you're right, I didn't even address that. But um, in general, the, the general view is that when you get a warming climate, you get uh, less overall precipitation, but you get more episodic precipitation. And you get less of snow and more as rain, in which tends to result in, in more flooding. You don't have all that moisture stored in a nice snowpack to come out evenly. Uh, through the summer. <clears throat> so you get scouring, you get, uh, you know, eggs flushed right out of the, out of the reds. Um, and, and that's a, <clears throat> this extremely negative impact on salmon when that happens. And it's, it's been pretty well documented in some areas, Kenai Peninsula, I know for sure that it's gotten increasingly dry, and yet they've had, they have these devastating floods, you know, they wipe out the, wipes out the 
highways, and that's true. And another contributor to that is the melting of the glaciers um, is making the Alaska Coastal Current, which goes up the arc of the um, Gulf of Alaska, is making it less salty, more um, the freshwater input is greater, and of course, freshwater is uh, salt water that's diluted with more fresh water is closer to neutral on the pH scale. So it's the melting of the glaciers is actually causing the ocean to become more acidic. Uh, so yeah, that's big. That's a big factor. And of course, they saw that down in Oregon, Washington, and Oregon and California, with devastating results down there. You know. And one of the, the factor of the anomalies in the jet streams anymore, too, is like the, the Pineapple Express. That's a stalled out jet stream where we're getting all the moisture <clears throat> coming directly at us without it you know, actually moving anymore. And we're also seeing that in the wintertime up in the Arctic where temperatures were 50 degrees above normal a considerable amount of the time. The multi-year ice is just about gone up there. It's just about gone. If people were aware of that. Um, your eyes would get big because it's we're down to basically the whole ocean opening up now and later freezes, earlier thaws, uh, methane hydrate that are said to be down there that could easily start bubbling, are bubbling up already, contributing to um, climate change or warming right there. <coughs> right there. Some, would, some would say it's, uh, it, it's got the potential to be a real disaster because methane is 30 times more powerful as a greenhouse gas. I mean, I mean, that's just some of the possibilities that are happening up there that might influence all of this other stuff. So, Mike? <coughs> yeah, it, you know, it's easy to draw a scenario that sounds pretty catastrophic, but I... I University know. of Alaska Fairbanks researchers are, are the ones that two Russian researchers have done most of the work. Mm -hmm. uh, Shaktova and uh, you know, Samelita, husband and wife team. Mm -hmm. But that information is available at UAF and they're, they're professors up there, so yeah. take it as you will. <laughs> yeah, that's good. That's a good point. That you know the fortunate thing is that the ocean is a huge buffer and to a very large extent, these kinds of things. I mean, in the long term, all that energy gets absorbed. It's it's stored. It doesn't go away. But it takes a long time for the for all that heat to be absorbed in a way that actually has a significant increase in the ocean temperature. The atmosphere, you know, it warms up really fast, but the ocean warms up very slowly. But it also sheds its heat slowly too. So whatever does occur over the next 50 years isn't going to go away. It's going to be with us uh, more or less indefinitely. Right, the, the lack of ice, ice and albedo um, on the Arctic Ocean means there's more heat retained in the Arctic Ocean. So whether it starts, keeps on building on itself. I mean, that's, that's the question mark in my mind. I mean, I'm not freaking out or anything. I'm going to be dead anyway. So <laughs> but I, I'm curious nonetheless. <laughs> Yeah, I don't mean to uh, diminish at all the, um, you know, the efforts that people are making to try to get control on that, on the production of greenhouse gas and all that. I mean, I, they're absolutely right. I have no, I have no doubt about that. I, I'm just trying to say, you know, it, it'd be easy to kind of get a panicky feeling if you hear all this, all this news. But most of these processes occur more slowly than the news comes out. You know, and, um, so I think. As I said, I think we're going to see profound change over the next 50 years, but I don't think it's going to be the end of the, end of the commercial fishery. That's my, my guess. Do you think that in your, from your experiences and what you know that possible Arctic fisheries for salmon, pink, and sockeye might at some point try to evolve? Well, that's a good... That's a good question. As you know, commercial fisheries are prohibited yeah. in the Arctic now. Um, and the species, as I understand, that are, that are there are, for the most part, not particularly valuable. You know, there's a lot of Arctic cod and saffron cod and a bunch of little flounders and things. Um, whether salmon colonize to the extent that there would be commercial salmon fisheries is a good question. Um, 
I, as I said, I think the limiter on salmon um, colonizing the Arctic is the, uh, is the stream conditions. Mm -hmm. And but as you say, the Arctic's getting warmer really, really fast, and maybe those streams, maybe in a decade, those streams will be uh, more soon. Mm -hmm. You know, they have a lot of fish. They have a lot of um, of uh, Dolly Varden and, and Arctic char, mm -hmm. and those are the same same mm -hmm. family of salmon. Yeah, I'm thinking like 40 <coughs> years. You know, like mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good question. I haven't really seen anybody who's really addressed that, mm -hmm. but sure, it seems it like seems what, possible. You know, management if, if it does happen in the future. Yeah, get a limited entry permit for for the Beaufort Sea Coast. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, um, in talking about all this, we we talked about the Pacific Decadal Oscillation, and um, it's in. Is it an extended warm phase right now? And are there indicators yeah. that, um, are, are there known indications or points of index to suggest a change to back to a cool phase? Because it there have been what they call, what some people call stanzas. There have been short periods of a couple of years. And I, I can remember, actually, I, I was like the late 90s, I think, that People were saying, oh, go get your crab gear out, you know, the ocean's starting to cool again, we're going to get, we're going to get our crab and shrimp back. Um, and then it never really quite panned out, because these, these cool stances were fairly brief. So, yeah, since, I mean, for quite a few years, it's been a predominantly warm uh, regime, yeah. There was a negative he uh, just a few years ago. You showed it in the graph earlier, yeah. and that coincided with the phenomenon here in uh, Cordoba. We called it the snowpocalypse. That's when it snowed like crazy. Oh, that, yeah. Because so, yeah. we've had almost the army no snow come out with a couple years after that. Yeah. 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 Leave, leave that one. Sorry, I just was, it was one. Uh, go back to that one. There also was an important anthropogenic cause in here. Uh, it was a project I worked on in 1982. Yes, we had the, the temperature spike, you know, as you say, around 76 and so on, and a decline in, in uh, crab. But a good part of the increase in cod and pollock abundance was the <coughs> Magnus Act just finally taking hold at that time. And the, 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 what? the Magnus Act just oh. finally taking a hold in the late mm -hmm. 80s, excuse mm -hmm. me, late 70s, early 80s. Mm -hmm. The foreign distant water high seas fleet pushed out. Mm -hmm. But domestic uh, production only beginning to ramp up. Right, yeah, At that time, I worked for Alaska Fisheries Development, and it, it was our job to convince people to go fish pollock and codfish. Yeah. Nobody was interested. Yeah. So those stocks went up dramatically, and that also played a role in the decline of the crab uh, species, because we found on a project that I uh, did, the, the number by, by abundance of stomach contents in, in cod and pollock, the, the highest order of magnitude were the five species of crab larvae. They so really you had high predation at the same time. Mm -hmm. So you had this, this temperature shift, you had uh, decreased fishing pressure on the predators, uh, and also very high fishing pressure on the, on the crab itself, of course. And, and so in addition to those being climate-related, uh, uh, they're also very much politically related to something. Yeah. A good part of that curve. Yeah, it was a kind of a triple whammy on the crabs. By the way, I, I just remember this publication that I that was on that second slide. I have a few copies of that. If anybody is interested, it's pretty much the same story that you heard just now. But if anybody wants one of these, you're welcome. Welcome to them. I'll just. Um, I almost forgot to mention that. Um, yeah, I want to go back to that original slide that showed the superior cycle. And now there's a shorter cycle that's taking place. It's about five years in period. That's why it was cold for a couple of years and it comes on up again. I do walk in and say, who knows? The guy that discovered that. Sorry, this is really. Yeah, you know, we call it the Victoria yeah. pattern. So you can see that there were curious. In the, around 2010 and, and later, yes. it got uh, more recently it got negative, and then it flipped back up again. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, so we're having shorter oscillations, and that's, that's known as the Victoria pattern because the person that published that 
did it in Victoria, BC. And he was, oh, is that right? He's been, he, I think he's even been to Cordova. He's been in Anchorage. He's a modeler for NOAA. Victoria so, Pattern. Yeah. And, and then the short. And then, yeah, and there's, there's more takeoffs on that. But that could be what's, what happened there. But we did have a very cold winter there, you know, during, in the, just after 2010. Was it 2012 when we had the snow pine 2011, 2012. Yeah. Because yeah. that coincides with that negative PDL. Blue, and then yeah. Same thing in the 1950s. It was cold and snowy when I was growing up in the southeast. Yeah, and yeah, that was during that. It was during this period along here when you have a, a you know, what they call a cool phase of the uh, PDO. Yeah. I think you could graph out the PDO by just the, by graphing out the days that the Cordova Ski Hill was open. <laughs> <laughs> really, you know, because yeah. they put it in in the 70s with all that snow, or cold weather, and then all of a sudden it stopped. Snowing. Right. And during the early 70s. Then there's you know, been little blips of it, not yeah. anything really consistent. Yeah, I was in graduate school. Right so here. right on the edge here with yeah. the freezing level in winter, I think you could, yeah. you could probably come up with a similar graph. Yeah. But I, I was told that in the early 70s it was like 60 below and the Fairbanks were 40 below for like weeks at a time. Yeah. Now we get like a couple of days of it, but they were saying it was like prolonged periods of extreme cold. I was there for it. Okay, so you, you remember. Yeah. I regress temperature against snowfall to this area, and it explains about half of the variability. Mm -hmm. You know, is temperature related, and then of course storm track and all of that. Um, but the PDO, I think it's a, is it, someone here maybe does what I mean, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but it's um, more of a statistical observation, or it's observation of when you have warm water against the coast versus cold water at the sea, or vice versa. But it's not like ENSO or El Nino, it's not an ocean atmospheric coupling. Mm -hmm. It's just an observation of where warm and cold is. So I think that's really important to note. Like El Nino is a physical connection between the ocean and the atmosphere. So it's a whole different ball of whack. This is an observation. So the question is, this is what's been observed in the past, is this pattern of water temperature and its relation with fisheries or snowfall or whatever we want to pick. But is that correlation going to hold into the future? Or are there other oscillations happening at different time scales that we don't fully understand or that would change as climate changes? It could, because yeah. this Victoria pattern that's, that was discovered is, could be a more recent phenomenon. But we probably still have the longer PDO, the 18.6 year cycle. Yeah. And yeah. that's actually maybe driven by the moon, because there's a lunar tidal phase that's 18.6 years. Really? And you should talk to Tom Royer, who's retired UAF faculty, but he's seen it in Halibut, but they've seen it in, in three rings going back as far back as possible. But the thing is, we don't have enough data. In order to resolve these real long periods, you've got to observe it for a couple hundred years. Because even in 200 years, that's only 10 periods of the 18.6-year uh, cycle. So. Yeah, everything I've been saying this evening is is really a, a simplification of much more complex systems, but it's something that's fairly easy to identify. Um, there are actually, there's more than one cycle, there's a, and they're on varying time links, but these are ones that are sort of, at least to me, are sort of most obvious and sort of have the most direct link to phenomena that we've observed, like abundance of some species and all that. But if you could, if you had all the computational capability of going back over a long time frame, you, it's, it's probably like waves intersecting wave trains, you know, coming from different directions of different cycles of these things. But well, my whole point is, about all that is, is, is that <coughs> the, the interannual and interdecadal variation is much greater than the long-term trend, and that, um, and that those things have identifiable consequences, and if, if those if the temperature regime that you saw during those periods were to become the long-term norm, then it would give us some idea of what, what might be coming down the road, what to expect in terms of fishery. There's also oscillations in other parts of the world. There's the North Atlantic Oscillation and there's a bunch more. And these oscillations may be interconnected. Mm -hmm. So, but we, still, we don't understand that yet. Yeah, a lot of our weather and climate here is actually driven by the Central Pacific. The Western Pacific, and that's something I can't even get my head around. Is mm -hmm. uh, but the you know the blob and these some of these other things have occurred actually in El Ninos. They don't start here; they start in the Central Pacific. So. 
Anyway, uh, I don't want to keep you. Thank you very much for coming. If anybody wants to stay and talk about anything else, I'll be glad to hang around. But um, I appreciate your uh, contribution to the discussion. Thank you.